There's one thing all these languages have in common. They suck. So you should learn Rust. But learning Rust is like trying to get a PhD in compiler theory while getting kicked in the b repeatedly. Unless you have a clear guide that maps all the features you already know and love from other languages to Rust. Welcome to Rust for Dummies, where I'll explain all the confusing Rust concepts you need to know to be an effective Rust developer in terms that even a JavaScript developer will understand. By the end, you'll not only get Rust, you'll start preaching Rust to all your coworkers unsolicited like a true Rustation. This video is part of a series for the upcoming official launch of my Rust Live Accelerator, the all-in-one Rust Live training program designed to help you land your first Rust job and become a high-performing Rust developer. The exact official launch date will be announced very soon. To join the waitlist, pause this video right now and visit letsgetrusty.com slash join. Part 1. Why Rust Code Doesn't Break You know those bugs that only show up in production? Seg faults, data corruption, mysterious system crashes? Rust eliminates those. At compile time, no garbage collector, no performance hit. But how does Rust achieve this? A C or C++ developer's biggest nightmare is double free or use after free errors, which can cause your entire program to crash, or worse, corrupt data silently. A double free occurs when you deallocate the same memory twice, which can corrupt the heap. And a use after free happens when memory is accessed after it's been freed, leading to undefined behavior. The problem is manually freeing memory is extremely error prone. In contrast, higher level languages prevent manual memory management bugs by introducing a garbage collector. This is an added background process that automatically frees memory after it's no longer used. This seems convenient, but garbage collectors are notorious for causing intermittent performance issues at runtime, as a garbage collector may pause one or more threads to reclaim memory. This is the type of unpredictable performance hit a systems programming language simply cannot afford. Luckily, Rust has a compile time solution to deal with memory management without incurring any runtime overhead, a brilliant system called the ownership model. In Rust, each value has a single owner. In this case, the user1 variable owns a user instance and controls the lifecycle of the value. When user1 goes out of scope, the value will be automatically dropped, all predetermined at compile time. But what happens when you reassign the value from user1 to user2, for example, or even pass the value into a function? Who ends up owning the value? In this example, the ownership of the underlying value gets transferred first from user1 to user2, and then from user2 to user3. And lastly, the user value gets dropped at the end of the function when user3 goes out of scope. Once ownership moves, the previous variable no longer claims the ownership of the underlying value, and it can no longer access the value either. This transfer of ownership is called move semantics, and it's really important because it eliminates nasty memory bugs like double free and use after free, which we saw in the C and C++ example before. So ownership and move semantics solve the problem of allocating and deallocating memory without manual memory management or a garbage collector. But ownership is only a piece of the puzzle. Sometimes you don't want to move or transfer the ownership of a value. For example, let's say we wanted to call print name twice. In this case, attempting to call print name the second time is not allowed because the ownership of the underlying user value has already been passed to the user3 argument inside the print name function during the first call to print name. What we really want is to give the print name function temporary access to the user instance while the user2 variable still maintains the ownership. In most other languages, you can hand out temporary access to a value by passing around references or pointers to the value. But the problem with references and pointers is they allow you to do dangerous, dumb, and terrible things like reading and writing to the same value at the same time, mutating shared state without realizing it, or dereferencing a null pointer. The gist is, these languages allow you to do dangerous things with references and pointers. That's how you get weird side effects, data races, and all types of bugs that only show up in production. The good news is, Rust has a clever solution for this as well, called the borrowing model. Rust allows you to gain temporary access to a value using references with a twist. Unlike other languages, references in Rust have certain rules to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot. First of all, Rust distinguishes between immutable references and mutable references. Let's go back to our previous ownership example. If we update the print name function to take an immutable reference to the user instance, our code will compile. We can also add an update name function and have it take a reference. But this time our code doesn't compile because we are trying to mutate a value behind an immutable reference. 
To fix this, we have to explicitly mark the user2 value as mutable and update the reference pass to the update name function to be a mutable reference. Now our code compiles. This explicit labeling of mutable references is great because it prevents accidental mutation. By the way, in the Rust world, a reference is synonymous with a borrow, and referencing is synonymous with borrowing. You'll hear both used frequently. That's why this is called the borrowing model. In our code example, we can say that print name takes an immutable borrow and update name takes a mutable borrow. So that's the first rule of the borrowing model. The second rule is that you can either have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references at one time. Rust prevents you from using immutable references while a mutable reference is active. For example, if we create two variables, one holding a mutable reference to the user instance and one holding an immutable reference to the user instance, and then pass those references to print name and update name, we would get a compile time error. The problem is the mutable and immutable borrows overlap. When we call update name, an immutable reference to the user instance exists and is passed to the print name function on the next line. This is problematic because the immutable reference is not expecting the underlying value to change. The Rust compiler wants to ensure that when you get an immutable reference to a value, it's guaranteed the value cannot be changed for as long as you hold that immutable reference. The solution is simple. We can define R2 after the call to update name, or we can simply inline the references like the original example. The third rule is, references must be pointing to valid memory. The compiler ensures this by checking to see if references are used after the underlying value has been freed. References to the user instance are only valid until user1 is dropped. After the user instance is dropped, references are considered invalid and we would get a compile time error if we tried to use them. This system of borrowing gives us the convenience of temporary access to values without the foot guns found in many other languages. Okay, so we talked about how Rust prevents an entire class of memory safety bugs through the ownership and borrowing model. But surely, Rust can't prevent logical bugs too, right? You know, those bugs you create when your brain isn't braining. Well, actually, it can, to a large extent. Let's see how. Part 2. The Genius of Rust Type System Imagine you update a dependency, some library you're using. There are no errors, everything compiles, so you ship your code and deploy it to the cloud. But then everything breaks in production. Why? Because the library author updated a function or removed a side effect, and your compiler didn't catch any of it. This happens all the time, not because library authors are careless, but because most languages don't give us the tools to express, and more importantly, enforce constraints through code. Let's say we're the ones working on the library and writing a user class in Java. We want to make sure other developers cannot misuse our data structure, so we need to enforce some constraints. First, every user is required to have a name, so our name variable here should never be null. To enforce that, we import an external library like Lombok, which provides us with a non-null annotation. We also want to make sure null values cannot be passed to our functions. Next, we want to enforce that our function arguments cannot be mutated within the functions by marking them with the final keyword. This prevents accidental mutation and communicates our intent to future developers modifying this class. Lastly, we need to handle a special case. Even though the user profile function argument passed in is non-null, its member variables can still be null. So we want to verify that the display name field of user profile is non-null at runtime. But now we run into another problem. If the display name is null at runtime, the non-null check here will throw a null pointer exception. But the callers of the from user profile function have no idea that it can throw by only looking at the function signature. So let's add in a java.comment to give callers a warning. Now, the funny thing is, null pointer exceptions in Java are so common that a typical Java developer probably wouldn't even bother adding a java.comment like this. So here we have it. We did all this work just to enforce some basic type constraints and make sure our user class is used properly. Now, imagine trying to get everyone else at a company to follow these strict guidelines to prevent misuse of their classes. Sorry, it ain't gonna happen. And Java is supposed to be a strongly typed language. We haven't even mentioned weakly typed languages yet, which are absolute dumpster fires. Okay, now let's see how we would enforce these same constraints in Rust. Here's how we would write the exact same user object in Rust. So what would we need to change to prevent null objects, accidental mutation, and unexpected exceptions? The answer is nothing. Rust's type system is safe and robust by default. For example, in Rust, null simply doesn't exist. 
Instead, we have the option enum wrapper, whose value can either be the sum variant containing an object or the none variant containing no object. So if we wanted the user's name to be optional, we would have to wrap it in an option enum. And the compiler will automatically make sure you handle both the none case and the sum case. Additionally, values in Rust are immutable by default. If we wanted our function arguments to be mutable, we would have to explicitly mark them with the mute keyword. This would let callers of the function know that the values they pass in might be mutated. Lastly, in Rust, we don't have to worry about exceptions. Instead, if we want the from user profile function to be able to handle potential failures, we would update the function signature to return a result enum wrapper, whose value could either be the error variant containing an error object or the okay variant containing the result. The beauty here is that function signatures in Rust tell you everything you need to know about the function. Does it mutate its arguments? Are the arguments passed by reference or value? Does it throw an error? Everything is explicit and clear at compile time. That's why when you write Rust code, you can have high confidence that if it compiles, it works. Now, of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg. To use Rust professionally, you also have to understand advanced features like async Rust, best practices and patterns, how to architect out Rust code bases, and much more. And you guys have been emailing me and asking me, how do I get good at Rust? Where do I find Rust jobs? And how do I get hired as a Rust developer? So over the last year, I've been working with individual developers to help them master the language and land Rust jobs. And after multiple iterations and refinements, we've built a rock solid training program that I'm now ready to share with you. And it's called the Rust Live Accelerator. In this private group training program, I'll personally work with you to take you from a beginner all the way to an employed Rust developer using a simple yet effective three-step roadmap that has worked for dozens of our students. So if you're serious about using Rust professionally, this program is for you. We'll start accepting applications soon and we'll only have 25 spots available. These spots are expected to go fast, so make sure you don't miss your chance to join by visiting letsgetrusty.com join and signing up for the waitlist right now. By signing up for the waitlist, you'll be the first to know when we start accepting applications. With that said, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and I'll see you in the next one.